Good evening, uh, friends. My name is Dick Blakeney, and I'm very pleased to uh, say a, a few words in advance of, of this program tonight and to welcome you with a few uh, brief uh, preliminaries. First of all, I want to talk about who the sponsor and co-sponsors are. The sponsor is the Salam Cultural Museum, which is a program that Rita started, I think, with some years ago. She may say something about that. The co-sponsors are the Arab American Community Coalition, the Episcopal Bishops Committee for Israel and Palestine, the Mideast Focus Ministry at St. Mark's Cathedral, uh, the United Nations Association of Greater Seattle, and their office, by the way, is right there, uh, and also University Temple United Methodist Church is one. So um, first of all, I, I want to say, uh, introduce Rita Zaweda, and I have known R Rita for over 10 years. Uh, she is a, a native of Jordan. She lived in Syria for about 10 years, is that correct? Um, but that was, and that was prior to coming to the United States. Uh, Rita runs a business, and it's a, a, the Caravan Sarai uh, Tours, and I was a recipient of, of those services when I went to Iraq in 2002, uh, and I greatly appreciated that. That was before the Iraq War. Um, <clears throat> uh, I can personally recommend her because she did such a fantastic job. Uh, she is one of the founders, then, of the Salam Cultural Museum, and she may say a few words about that when she speaks. Um, and it was primarily, and I, I said was, primarily focused on the uh, cultural understanding of the Middle East and training teachers uh, uh, in this area. She is a member of the Seattle Police Advisory Council and has been honored for, for the, the work that she did there. Uh, however, about a year ago, maybe over a year ago, uh, with the uh, Syrian uh, crisis, the Salam Cultural Museum's focus changed, and it <clears throat> changed to providing critically needed supplies for the refugees from the Syria uh, um, uh, uh, the Syria civil war. Um, she has provided, um, I think we said in, in the publicity, she has sent seven containers, she has sent two ambulances, she has organized medical delegations to go to, is that primarily to, to, uh, to uh, Jordan? Jordan and on the borders of Syria. Uh, Jordan and on the borders of, of Syria. She made a trip, another trip to Jordan uh, for about two weeks, and she just returned the day after yesterday. So I would say, <laughs> uh, Rita, you're, you're magnificent. I'll introduce the other speaker at this point. He is Richard Silverstein, and Richard uh, is a freelance journalist, and he's a Seattle, Seattleite who writes the Tikkun uh, Olam blog, which means repairing the world. Uh, it, and he produces it, um, that's, it means in Hebrew, that's the Hebrew translation. Uh, it's a political blog which he initiated in 2003 and reports practically every night, and usually more than one blog, uh, on information that uh, he is revealed that has been censored in Israel. Um, it's a progressive forum which is devoted to studying Israel's relationship with its Arab neighbors. Uh, he's also written for the Huffington Post, The Guardian, Haaretz newspaper, uh, Los Angeles Times, and, and some others. Uh, so we, we welcome them to speak with us. Well, good evening, and um, I'm sorry we can't get any pictures, but um, I really want to start out with, I have a a letter that I just got today from one of the doctors that was on my mission. And when I got it in email, I was just, it really affected me a lot. And I'd like to read that to you all before I actually start. Uh, the darkest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain their neutrality in times of moral crisis by Dan Brown Inferno. Bed number one, 18 month old girl with left lower leg amputated, scared. Bed number two, 
young man with left lower leg amputated, still smiling. Bed number three, 17 year old young lady, rocket landed on her house. She was pregnant, lost the baby, lost lower left leg, bladder injury, colonoscopy, lost her vision, lost her hearing in one ear, staring in the ceiling into empty space. Her husband, only 20 years old, never left her bedside for the last two months. ICU, bed one, young man with bilateral above the knee amputation with right hand injury. A rocket landed close to him and all that he remembers until he woke up in ICU a few days ago. Full determination, but in pain and agony. ICU, bed two, 23 year old male was imprisoned by the Air Force Security Intelligence for several months. The thugs threw liquid on their cell floor, which is very toxic fumes, resulted in immediate death of four of the prisoners. He lost consciousness and was picked up last Friday at the border. The prison was liberated. K8.3 Bun 300 cardiopolithy with EF 15% recovering slowly. After he finished his story, he broke an agonizing cry, which made everyone sobbing, determined that there is no way back. Spinal cord injury unit, bed number one, 13 year old beautiful girl with bullet through T10 paraplegic sniper attack. Bed number two, 13 year old girl like a flower, bullet through T11, which she was fleeing Dada two months ago, paraplegic. Bed number three, 90 year old young lady with sniper bullet through her right temper, progressing slowly. Bed number four, two year old old boy with a bullet through his right neck, spinal cord hemorrhage, recovering nicely. Shall I keep going? Synopsis of what the criminals of the regime are doing to our innocent civilians. They have drifted genetically. They don't belong to the human race. When do we scream? When do we become angry? How long do we stay silent? A message to everyone I know, seeing is not the same as hearing or listening. These are real people who lost everything. If we don't stand by them now, then I don't know when. To me, that was just very powerful and it really states a lot of everything that I see every two months when I go back. Um, and I wish the presentation would have worked because it shows you how when, the f when it first started in Syria and people started crossing over the border, you have al Zatari camp, which is the camp that everyone hears about. And that was a camp that started out for 5,000 people. And each month it has progressed. And ever since I've been going, the numbers have mounted. In March, when I was there, this last March, it was 173,000 in this one camp, which is the population of Linwood. Uh, this time when I went, it was 220,000 people. It is the largest refugee camp in the world. These are people that are all living in tents. It's in the middle of the desert, very low water supplies, low on everything. But besides the camps, we also have over 250,000 uh, refugees that are living in the city of, of Amman and in outskirt line areas. These are the people that have their paperwork when they left home. So they were able to intermingle with society. But you know, most people leave home thinking it's only gonna be a month or two months. Two years later, they have no money. There's nothing. The NGOs that are in the country are running out of money to keep people going totally. It's just, it's very, very difficult. 50% of the population of refugees that are in Jordan at this point are women and children. And um, they are in dire straits. I mean, it's the stories that you hear uh, every single day when we go in. I mean, we. This last group of doctors was 34 doctors that went in with me. And what we do is we take medications from here that are donated from different organizations, 
or people like yourselves who had somebody that's passed away, they have medicines in their cupboards they don't need, and so we take those all in. I usually go in with about 10 suitcases full of medication with me. And we end up then, all the doctors bring in medications. So we have about, perfect, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so do you want to just flip through it? And um, these are just some of the kids. These are our Syrian numbers that we have, but these are numbers from May. So these numbers are changing on a regular, regular basis. Do you want to move it? This is just showing you Syria and the countries that are surrounding it. So depending on where you live in Syria is where you're going to run away to. Um, so if you're up in the north where I lived, it's in up Aleppo, you are close to the Turkish border. And so usually it would be um, about an hour to get up there. Because of the situation now, there are uh, different patrol people. We have no idea who they are uh, from day to day, if they are uh, military from the government or they are some rebel group that we don't know, and there's so many different rebel groups around that you have to keep your paperwork on you continuously. If you have a card, they will stop you. And you don't know if you're gonna be killed, if you're on the right side or the wrong side at the time. Um, if you're in Damascus, you can go off to Lebanon if you want, or you can try and make it to Jordan. Usually from Damascus to Jordan, it's a three hour trip. But because of the conditions that are on right now, those things can take you three, four, five days to get over to Jordan. Most people travel late at night, so they're just walking. They walk with whatever they have. If they've been injured, they are carrying their injured with them and just going through. Once they get to the border, the Jordanians are at that border and they have a process of checking people, checking their ID, whatever they need, giving them um, some blankets, some water, and uh, then they will, if they have no paperwork, they are taken on a bus and they are taken to one of the camps. Once they're registered in the camps, they are given a tent, uh, blankets, and some ration of food and water, and that's it. And then that will happen every day. Now, if they have their paperwork, then they're allowed to go into the cities to try and find a place to rent or whatever um, they want. Uh, they are usually able to pay rent for up to about three months, uh, most of these people. After that, they can't. There's no jobs, there's no nothing. These are um, the people that are living in the cities, we call them, you know, that they're the forgotten souls because nobody goes after them. None of the NGOs go and try and find them. Everyone goes into uh, the camps only. So our group goes into the cities and we hear about it from one person tells another person about it. So you will have a room that is about a quarter of the size of this room and you'll have 40 people living in it with nothing else, they'll just have this room. They might be lucky if they have some mattresses or anything else uh, that goes on. Uh, if they're sick, if they're older, they, you know, nobody's there to take care of them. You, they might just have, it would be like an old people's home here in the States that is really bad. Uh, nobody changing their diapers, nothing. You can come into these homes and you smell the urine, you smell everything, it's, and you try and do whatever you can for these people. Um, do you want to change it? So, okay, we'll move it again. Uh, so most of the people are, Jordan has the highest number of the refugees that are coming into Jordan. You have a lot on the Turkish border that go in, uh, but as you've read and read in the news, there's been a lot of fighting on that border that's coming through. It was, oh, it was controlled by the government at one point, and then it was controlled by the rebels at another point. Rihania, there was a lot of bombing that went in, which is on the border town between uh, Syria and Jordan. And so now Turkey is having a real issue because they're running out of space also for taking people in. Lebanon is um, 
not really being that friendly with people because they don't want the same situation that happened with them like it happened with the Palestinians. So there is really not many NGOs that are working with them in Lebanon at all. Uh, most of them are sitting in, in the Bakal Valley area, which is very close to the Syrian border. And those people have maybe tents, but the water is really bad. They're using water that uh, they're washing in, they're drinking in, and they're cooking in it. So you can imagine right now with this, you have dysentery, you have typhoid, you have yellow fever, we have scabies, we have cholera. Uh, all of these are pan epidemic portions at this point right now. And with the weather conditions, it's really bad. Do you want to move? This is our ratio, which has now changed because we have it almost now as higher females than we do have males that are going in. I'm going to move it. This is the map I was telling you about of Zatari that you can see. And we'll just keep moving it through. And you can see how it's expanded every month, you know, from, from November up from 5,000 to 11,000, goes 12,000. And the space just keeps going on. All of these people, all they have is just tents to live in. That's it. There's nothing else. The conditions are very harsh in the winter. A um, lot of rain and snow, and they just were, you know, most of them just ran out of their homes with barefooted, not having any clothing, not having any shoes or anything. So we were trying to get um, a lot of our first containers that went in was mostly clothing that we took into people. I'm going to move it. And we can do it again. Um, now, these, this is a new camp that was just opened uh, back in January. And these are what they call is these are containers, uh, almost like your shipping containers. And those are incredible in the summertime because it's so hot. And there's nothing in these containers. They are just an empty space that you go into. They, it was done by the Qatari government. Do you want to move that? And you have bathrooms that are not in the containers, not in, uh, those are separate. So what they have is they built these so that you have um, 500 to a grouping, and every 500 will have two facilities of bathrooms and showers that take 10 people in them. That is it. Um, and all you can do is sleep in that in the home. There's no kitchen, there's nothing. They just give it to you with blankets, and you're lucky if we even give mattresses at all on these things. Um, it started out for 5,000 people. It has now been expanded to 20,000 people, and it still needs to expand again. Same thing. Want to move it? Uh, these are the, the kids, and you know, just and the kids have the worst portion of this thing because. A lot of the groups are dealing with the medical conditions of the kids, but no one is actually dealing with the mental issues that are going on, the trauma, the PTSD, everything that's happening to these kids. Um, one kid that I saw that was uh, five years of age, I tried to get the kids to come out to play from a house, and uh, the mother said, he won't go. He won't leave at all, this room. And I says, why? And she says, well, at the beginning of the uh, crisis, he was always looking out the window and watching and seeing what was happening. One day that he's out there, he sees a truck pull in. And what you have is the soldiers came, and they have people in the truck. And he saw his father and uncle and some relatives. The military started throwing the bodies out of the truck. and. Then they ended up jumping out of the truck and they started chopping him up. And this little kid was looking at it. He's never looked out a window again. Um, you have so many different atrocities that I, don't, I can't even call these people animals anymore because I think animals have more decency than what's actually happening at this point in Syria. Uh, another little girl that would come into the clinic, because we have these clinics, and they're called medical days. Do you want to change it? And we would go in to a village. Um, this is water that is being brought in 
on a regular basis as much as you can. Jordan is a very poor country, has very little water. Uh, before we, before this crisis, the government would deliver water on a weekly basis to the different homes. Uh, what happened now is that water is running so low. When you have a million and a half people that have sort of come into your country, uh, you now the restriction is that its water is being delivered two times, twice, uh, once every two weeks. So this is going to start causing problems between the Jordanians and the Syrians at some point. Um, when the Iraqis came in to Jordan during the Gulf War, the Iraqis came in with money and they were able to pay for things. The Syrians are coming with nothing at all, just whatever they can carry out of their homes. And so at the very beginning, the Jordanians are very hospitable with them. But at some point they say, well, we got poor Jordanians at the same time and they're taking away a lot of our resources. So we're not sure how long it's gonna last before something really happens between the two groups that goes on. Do you wanna change it? These are the people at the entrance of Zatari to come in. It looks like a, a concentration camp in some ways, you know, the way you're just set up. Because once you get in, you cannot leave. They don't want you to run around the country since nobody knows who you really are and who you really support. So the Jordanians want to make sure that you don't have any of the government forces there. Uh, some snuck in that said that they had deserted and some of the stories that you hear about the fires at the camps were started by some of the um, military people that went in. Uh, a number of the rapes that took place uh, were also done in the camps by some of the military. So what they've started to do is they have now a separate camp for the deserters, which they stay totally separate from the people. Um, because a lot of the people here still have family in Syria and they're very, very scared of, you know, the family end up hearing about it at all and something happening to their families. Can I move it? These are people waiting on the outskirts of the Dara border to try and get in um, into Jordan. And you'll see it's just women and kids. And the stories, I think every time I go, I have to come back here just to decompress because it's just to hear everything that's going on. A young kid that tells me his mom can't stop crying. Uh, she's always crying. A boy that tells me that um, he was had to rape his sister in front of his family. Uh, women that were raped by knives being inserted inside them um, so that they just had, there was nothing left of them totally. People that just don't have a will to live, you know, they're just not going to be sure what's going to happen. We have so many amputees that the whole country is going to have to change. Um, yeah, and the Middle East is not known as a country for handicaps. You don't have the handicap ramps or bathrooms or anything like you do here in the States. So when this country gets to be rebuilt, it's something's going to have to happen. Uh, we're also, as Arabs, are, if there's something wrong or you're missing a limb or an arm or something, um, you know, society usually says, oh, well, you're not a person anymore. So we have to change that whole mentality of people. So some of these young people that we visit in the hospitals, they ask, am I ever going to get married? Will I ever have a baby? You know, just normal questions that you have to deal with. Um, do you want to change it? Uh, we can just flip through it, you know. This is just stuff that we've done to this point. Um, but it's just, there's just too much stuff to do. I mean, we'll just never finish with everything that has to be done. We'll just move it. And we are, this is a meeting that um, the, not this group, the other group met with the Jordan, uh, with the American ambassador. We were asking them for assistance. And I never realized that um, the U.S. government does not have medical facilities that they'll take into a country, except if it's a country that's in a war zone. You have to be actually in war where they'll have the hash mash units type of thing that you see. So the units that we have inside the camps are 
uh, Doctors Without Borders, Physicians for Social Responsibility, a Moroccan group, and a Saudi group, and that's it. Um, the Americans try and help by giving you know, money or aid, but they don't have any medical units at all through there. We are asking them for help to be able to get the Syrian American or American doctors that go with us to be able to operate. Um, and so they're working with that on us. Because um, what happens, it's similar to if a doctor comes from out of the country from England, comes to the US, he has to take exams before he can actually work in the hospitals here. And Jordan has that same principle. So we're able to give medication, see the clients, uh, but they still have to have operations by the Jordanians. A lot of the hospitals will not give pro bono work, so it has to be paid for. And that's money that we try and raise for some of these people um, with what's going on. Do you want to change it? This is the spinal cord clinic and a couple of the doctors. And it's set up with regular beds. You know, there's nothing in there. so. We have been able to get hospital beds from here that have been donated. We've been able to take them in um, so they can use them. We've gotten some rehab equipment. Can you change it? And then thanks. So, um, and none of these people that we see are fighters at all. These are all people that were in the wrong place at the wrong time and were hit by snipers. Uh, the snipers hit the people between the fifth and the seventh vertebrae. I've been told by the doctors, which will end up uh, making them paraplegic immediately. And so they'll just never walk at all. And we're talking about 16, 17 year old kids. Some of the kids I saw was a, a six month old baby that already had the legs amputated, uh, a three month old that had shrapnel in the eyes and was totally, it was blind, you know, and we can just go on and on with some of this. I move it. These are the ambulances that we ended up purchasing and um, through donations by a number of people. It's, and some people in this room that have actually made these donations to us. So we were able to buy these in Montreal and we got them shipped in uh, to Mersin into Turkey. And then from Turkey, we have people that come in and they drove the vans down into Syria. So we're right at the borders. Um, they come in. It's very hard if you're from Hama and Homs, which is in the middle of the country, which is really places that are being bombarded on a regular basis, uh, to be able to get in there because uh, anyone we send in uh, has been killed at some point. So we've been able to find a way to get medicines in, and that's been through the sewage lines, that there are people that are willing to go through the sewage lines and get the medicine through to get it into some of the hospitals. Um, the doctors that are working there are really risking their lives because the government is hitting uh, hospitals or ambulances or anybody or doctors. You know, they're pinpointing them because if they're helping the people. Can you move in? Um, this is the new spinal cord clinic and you can see we've gotten hospital beds for most of the patients at this point. Uh, we were able to rent this whole building out for $32,000 for the full year. So it was a great deal. And then, so it is three stories that we have that's been set up uh, for anyone with spinal cord injuries. Um, we have just set up a place for women in the first floor that we're helping them survive and get going in that we, we supply them with materials and they do some of the handicrafts that you'll see inside. And we pay them five, 250 Jordanian dinars a month, which is about $400. And they are you know, feeling proud that they can go and say that they're working and helping the families instead of having their hands out and trying to just get uh, money from being out in the street or selling their bodies. We have a lot of prostitution that's taking place um, in Mufrak, which is a village that is about an hour outside of Jordan, that uh, in April we found 187 prostitution homes. And that's in an area where you've never had prostitution. But you know, in times of war, a lot of things take place that you just don't expect to take place at all. There's a lot of families that, that are actually um, selling their daughters 
uh, not selling them, but it's you know getting them married at a young age, at 13 or 12 or 14, where they don't really know, but they figure that's the only way they can protect their kids uh, from rape at all that's taking place in the country. Want to move in? This is our um, our warehouse here in Bothell, where we have uh, the donations that people bring us from medical supplies. We had. Hasbro Toys donated 11,000 toys to us, and that just arrived in Jordan, so we were able to, going to be handing it out to them during um, Ramadan, and we're working with Mercy Corps on that. Um, Salam, my organization, has gotten its NGO status in Jordan, so we are official in Jordan, so anything we do now uh, makes it a lot easier that we can partner with a lot of the bigger organizations. And this is all donated. You know, we don't pay for any of this stuff at all. Uh, the warehouse space is donated. Uh, a lot of the shipping of the containers, we have a company in Los Angeles that's actually donated a lot of the, it's like we pay for four shipments and then they'll give us one free. So it works out really well for us. Um, all the people that work with my organization are 100% volunteer. So 100% of the money that's given is all being used for the refugees totally. And with that, this is just loading of the trucks. We try and uh, document everything we do, all the paperwork, all receipts, all medicines, everything that's going on. Can you change it? Um, just one of the, the children. I think the children are the ones that break your heart the most, that once you go in, you cannot not stop keep going back. Um, the doctors are, you know, are always crying when they see this. I mean, it's, these are just innocent souls. There's no reason that anything like this should happen to them. These are our next generation and we have no idea what they're going to be like or what's going to happen to them. I lived under um, Bashar's father's reign when I lived in Syria from 73 up until 84. And I spent two weeks in their jails. I know what it feels like. Uh, my ex-husband spent a year in jail uh, at that time. And this is at the time when um, he came in and he leveled the town of Homs totally and killed 10,000 people. It hasn't, you know, his son is worse than the father by far in the things that he's doing. Can I move it? Just more of the, the children. Uh, on this trip, I was at the border uh, in Dara'a, which is one where pretty much the whole revolution started. And all we did was hear the gunfire, the bombs, everything on a daily basis that was going on. But we were there to meet the people and get as many people as we could out of there and into, into Jordan. So, I mean, I could keep on talking, but uh, did we want to do question and answers now or after? Yeah. After, okay. So um, just to tell you, you know, it's uh, uh, Joanne, there's a woman here in the audience in the back. Um, she ends up making these incredible dolls. And so she brought these dolls over. And on this trip, I took a lot of, we mailed some uh, in our container and some I took with us and we, went out to the different villages, and the Raggedy Ann dolls were the biggest hit from the adults to the littlest kid, everybody wanting this little Raggedy Ann. And it wasn't little, I shouldn't say it's about this high. And then she had them at different levels and stuff. And, you know, so we're just looking for anything like that because it's like if you can imagine, um, you know, Oklahoma City and the tornadoes that took place and, you know, people losing everything. But we're in the U.S., so we can document and you can give it. In Syria, there is no documentation. Once you've left there, you have no way of proving who you are. And these kids are your kids or getting passports or getting anything. So we can't even bring the most serious cases like we did in Iraq where we could bring them here. In Syria, it's different. We can't bring these kids to the US because they have no paperwork. The US will not allow them in. We can't get their paperwork out of Syria. 
Um, you know, the, U, uh, the Middle East does not have adoptions like you have here. So we can't even bring the orphans or do anything for these orphans because it looks like that we're going to be selling them. So we're trying to open an orphanage or a place that you can put these orphans until we can find some extended family, somebody rather to help them out. Um, this is a situation that I can't see ending very soon. I mean, it's something that's going to really stay around quite a bit. Uh, you know, with our government, and Richard will talk about this more, um, since I'm supposed to really stay away from politics with our NGO status, um, with the government here of the FBI that comes in and questions me about the work that I do, and then the Jordanian government also questions everything that I do at the same time of working with Syria. So I'll leave that to Richard to talk about at all. But I think um, I just really want to thank you all for being here. Uh, it's beautiful weather out there. It's great that you're interested. We need to get the word out more about Syria. I think there's just so many people that have left it in the back and it's not there in the news much anymore. Um, you know, but it's still going on and people are suffering every day. And we have three, two to three thousand people crossing the Jordan-Syrian border on a daily basis. And when you have a population of 23 million people in Syria, and we already have a million and a half in Jordan, 3.5 million people that are displaced in the country that are just living under trees or hallways or wherever else they can, um, and I got still lots of family there that I, I talked to, but um, they're having a hard time, but they don't want to leave. You know, nobody wants to leave their home if they can stay in it, because once you do, it's, everything is robbed. It's, you're not sure you're going to get out of the country. You're not sure if you're going to die on your way out, and especially if you're an older person. You know, they say, how can we live if we end up leaving you know, we can live for a month or two months, but you can't live for two or three years. You know, nobody has that kind of money sitting in, in savings or whatever. If it's savings, it's in a bank that the, you know, the government has. So we're sort of left here. So thank you very much, and we'll answer your questions later. Okay. I want to start by um, thanking. Um, um, Dick for serving as liaison with the church um, and helping us to get this facility to do the event tonight and, and Rita for being my partner and putting on the program and all of the local co-sponsoring organizations. I want to thank them all for um, supporting us in this important uh, event uh, and this important subject that we're trying to raise interest about. Um, I, uh, you'll have to forgive me, I'm going to read my talk. Rita is great at being extemporaneous, and I admire people like Steve Naiva at Evergreen who can deliver uh, an extemporaneous talk uh, for 30 minutes without any notes, but uh, not me, so excuse that. Um, right from the beginning, um, I think we need to acknowledge that this is an impossible moral dilemma. Um, the conflict presents us. Two years ago, in the spirit of the Arab Spring that swept through the Middle East, the Syrian people rose up against the brutal, corrupt, nepotistic Assad dynasty. They used classic forms of nonviolent resistance. They streamed from Friday prayer in the mosques and, and churches into the public square, using religion as an expression of their moral opposition. They rallied, they shouted slogans, they published broadsides. It was almost a classic lesson in civic participation. This was the same force that toppled the Tunisian and Egyptian dictatorships, and the Syrians had every hope and reason to believe it might do the same for them. Instead of engaging in dialogue with the opposition, proposing or implementing reforms, Bashar al-Assad summoned his brother's commandos and brutalized these civilian, unarmed civilian protesters. They turned guns, helicopters, jet fighters, artillery, and missiles on unarmed civilians and mowed them down in their thousands and tens of thousands. At that point, the opposition had a fat 
fatal, fateful choice. It could continue on the path of nonviolence and suffer an ongoing slaughter, or it can arm itself and fight the regime's fire with its own. And it chose fire. At first, the, arms re the armed resistance was domestic and relied solely upon what it could muster inside the country in the way of recruitment and weapons. But as the brutality of government forces increased, the resistance responded in kind. Soon it was turning to outside forces for support. As the majority of Syrians are Sunni, while the Assadists are Shiite or Alawite, the opposition turned to other Sunni countries to meet their needs, their military needs. That meant Qatar, Turkey, which had provided the lion's share of armaments for the free Syrian army. To be clear, foreign intervention isn't a one-sided deal. Assad has received major support from Russia and Iran for decades. That includes advanced weaponry like anti-aircraft and ground-to-ground -ground missiles. Syria's other ally, Hezbollah, has also served as a useful proxy both in Lebanon and Syria. So each side in this conflict is guilty of turning to outsiders for lethal support. Unfortunately, a conflict that began as an act of civil, civic protest turned into an increasingly ethnic conflict between Shia and Sunni. And of course, Christian Syrians are wedged into that as well. And, and they're a smaller minority and probably suffer more as a result. Assad's Shia allies are Iran and Hezbollah, while the opposition's Sunni allies are Qatar and Turkey. So far, the United Nations estimates that nearly 100,000 have died. There are at least, uh, we just saw the figure of one and a half million refugees, it's probably much larger, in th four neighboring countries. And Rita spoke so eloquently of her work in bringing them humanitarian relief. And I'm hoping that we will raise as much money as we can to support her after we um, pay for some of the expenses uh, of the event tonight. Going back to the conflict, each side is playing a game of chicken. They realize that if they violate the rules of the game and cross red lines, the other side will do the same. That's why Russia hasn't yet supplied the SA-300 anti-aircraft missiles it contracted to do uh, to Syria. Because Israel has made clear that such a game-changing weapon would likely be used by Hezbollah against it. And Israel would likely attack any weapons convoy in Syria in order to take out such armaments. And it has done this twice in the past few months. Hezbollah recently also made a critical choice to escalate the conflict by sending 4,000 of its fighters into the town of Qusair. This is an act of outside intervention that exacerbates the hostile feelings both inside Syria and Lebanon itself, since many Lebanese do not approve of the Shia militia, Hezbollah taking its battles outside Lebanon. Some, like Israel's intelligence correspondent Ronan Bergman, have forecast the demise of Nasrallah because of this detour away from Hezbollah's core mission to resist Israel. But the rumors of his fall, Nasrallah's fall, are premature. Though the US didn't phrase it this way, President Obama's recent announcement that the US would begin arming the rebels came as an indirect response to this escalation by Hezbollah in Qusair. Of course, we publicly stated the real reason, the, 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 uh, the reason that we offered was that we said, we have proven that Assad has used chemical weapons against his people. It's likely that he has. It's possible that other forces in Syria have used chemical weapons as well. But to my mind, this uh, WMD justification was an after the fact kind of situation. In this conflict as in Iraq, WMD seems as much a political as a military issue. It's used by outside forces to justify whatever course of action they'd already decided upon. Bush did it in Iraq and now Obama looks like he's gonna do it in Syria. Our CIA is already training uh, Syrian rebels in Jordan, and now we will be arming them as well. And here's where we get to the other part of the dilemma. Should the US intervene right now, militarily? My answer is no. Not because I'm a pacifist, 
or believe the U.S. should never intervene in such situations. There are times when I believe military engagement is morally justified. Rwanda, Kosovo, places like that. I believe the Assad regime, and, and Rita has proven it uh, in spades, is evil and should be overthrown. But I'm not prepared to do this as a United States citizen for the Syrians themselves. The reasons not to do this are obvious. We can look at what happened in Iraq. We were going to overthrow Saddam and hand democracy to the Iraqis on a silver platter. But it didn't work out that way. I wouldn't be opposed to some form of US intervention if the Syrian opposition had a unified political and military agenda, if it could demonstrate that it had surmounted the ethnic rivalries and religious hostilities, I would support a greater level of involvement. But unfortunately, the rebel leaders haven't shown that level of maturity or stability yet. Instead, some of the strongest fighters on their side have been the al-Nusra Front, an extremist Sunni faction allied with al-Qaeda. Those fighting units which are more secular or more religiously moderate have not shown the same cohesion, the same toughness of the extremists. As a result, if we now play a definitive role in determining the outcome, we risk bringing to power the forces that will be the most hostile to democratic values and religious tolerance. And these are ideas that will be sorely needed to rebuild Syrian society after the civil war ends. And it will end, hopefully, sooner rather than later. The Syrians have to take control of their own destiny. They have to determine who will govern them and what sort of government it will be. I don't have a problem with other regional forces taking a role in this. Turkey as a neighbor is intimately connected to Syria and stability there in Syria is critical for Turkey. But the Turkish government so far has taken a very measured approach and has not enabled the rebels to decisively defeat Assad. In addition, Turkey itself faces massive civil disruption in the form of the Taksim Square uh, protests and that will likely uh, um, diminish the level of engagement of Turkey in this for some time to come. So if Syria's Arab Muslim neighbors can't produce a coherent response to Assad, who are we as Americans to do so on our own? There are two other 800 pound gorillas on stage, on this stage. Um, one is on the stage and one hovers off, just off stage. The first one, the one that is on stage is Iran. Assad's key ally. It provides him with both financing and the weapons to pursue this butchery till the end. Without Assad, Iran's support for Hezbollah would also be in jeopardy since weapons are transferred to Lebanon via Syria by, by Iran. Without a compliant Syria, Hezbollah would not aggressively confront Israel. And in this sense, the Lebanese militia serves Iran's interest should Israel attack Iran as Bibi Netanyahu has many times said that he would like to do. Not to mention the Shia religious axis of Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, religious solidarity plays a strong role in motivating the conflict. The longer the blood flows, the more divisive this particular element will become. As we all know, benign conflicts can flare into raging conflagrations when religious hatreds are introduced. Let's not forget an important recent development in Iran. A relative moderate, Hassan uh, Rouhani, came from virtually nowhere to defeat seven candidates in the presidential election. Each of those candidates was more dour and conservative than the next and more uh, uh, loyal to the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei than the next. Rouhani is a little bit breaks the mold. Um, <laughs> He's what, in an American context, we'd call a hard-headed realist. He puts Iran's interests, of course, above all the rest. He's a strong, tough negotiator. But he realizes when the proper moment to compromise has come, and he has, in the past, created interesting, creative uh, compromises involving Iran's nuclear program, among other things. Expecting Rouhani, on the, uh, uh, on the other hand, to be Iran's Martin Luther King and to uh, bring about uh, democracy in Iran or to overthrow the clerical regime, that is being very unrealistic. 
Um, he's a product of the regime, albeit a pragmatic one. Now, let's talk about the offstage guerrilla, not so offstage, and that's Israel. It has a deep and vested interest in Syria. At least it sees itself as having that, um, which has been a frontline state uh, between, uh, with Israel going back to the 1948 war. Israel conquered the Golan from Syria in 1967, and there are scores of uh, Druze villages on the Israeli side of the border and on the Syrian side. Israel maintains an interest in the villages, the Syrian Druze villages that are on the other side of the border, um, and it has uh, sent its own special forces into Syria itself. In other words, it has uh, violated the sovereignty of Syria by sending these troops in. And what they do is they liaise with the Syrian Druze villagers. There has been uh, some really uh, um, hard fighting in the Golan on the Syrian side between Syrian government forces and the rebels. And some of the re those rebels have been the Syrian Druze uh, um, uh, villagers. So Israel, if there is chaos and disintegration in the Golan, like there has been in other parts of Syria, it's conceivable that Israel either will itself invade Syria or occupy Syria or use a proxy like the Syrian Druze uh, to cut off a slice of, uh, of Syria, cut off a slice of territory and have an autonomous kind of situation in the Golan. And that is what some analysts foresee possibly happening in all the different parts of Syria, where northern Syria might be um, broken off and be uh, one entity, and the coast, Syria coast, where the Alawites are, might be a different entity that would be controlled maybe by the government. And the Golan could conceivably uh, be controlled by proxy by Israel. And Israel has done this before in southern Lebanon, where it had the Christian South Lebanese army as its proxy and used it to um, act as a cushion, as a shield, between uh, Hezbollah and the other anti-Israel forces in Lebanon. And this kind of act ends badly. As we could see in, in, in Lebanon, Israel lost uh, scores, if not hundreds of troops uh, in, in, terror, in, in, in uh, Hezbollah mil militia attacks. And the same thing would eventually happen in Syria if Israel did this. It would be a disaster, this kind of intervention by Israel for the Syrians because it would ensure that Israel carved out this slice of territory. It would fragment Syria and continue the process of disintegration inside the country. It would add years to the healing process and rebuilding of the nation. And just as the Lebanese civil war has taken decades to recover from. It would be disastrous for Israel as well, although its leaders don't think that obviously. It would cement Israel's reputation as a meddlesome, aggressive, untrustworthy regional force. Iran could use the excuse of intervention to ratchet up pressure and its own military posture inside Syria, and it, Iran could even escalate its nuclear program in response. The reason Israeli intervention in Syria would be bad is the same reason the first President Bush demanded Israel not respond when Saddam launched Scud missiles that hit Tel Aviv in the first Gulf War. The fight against Saddam's forces was hard enough without adding the Israeli wild card into the mix. What does that leave us with? I'm afraid, as I said in the beginning, there are no easy answers. The conflict is fraught morally and politically. Assad must go, but how to make it happen? The process must be done carefully and judiciously in terms of outside uh, action. But this need for caution, unfortunately, means that Syrians will continue to die, and that is only one part of this tragedy. The onus is on the Syrian opposition. They must step up to the plate, they must organize, they must coalesce, they must be worthy of assuming the leadership, the mantle of leadership. The last thing Syria needs now is a repeat of the Saddam disaster in which a tyrant is violently overthrown and a vacuum allows the most intolerant violent forces to come to power. Though 100,000 Syrians have died thus far, millions have died in Iraq in a decade of fighting there. Let's not let that be the fate of Syria. <laughs> now, I, I want to thank you for being patient, and I have one last portion of what I'm going to say, and I want to make clear that this is 
a dream, a political dream that I have. It may be an unrealistic dream, but I, I want to think positively, and I'm sure that you do as well. And so let me just humor me while I reel off this dream I have. Um, <clears throat> um, let's put forward two leaders, two national leaders, Barack Obama and Hassan Rouhani. Let's put forward these two leaders who rise to the better angels of their nature. Leaders who realize that the interests of each of their country may be realized by a comprehensive settlement of all the outstanding issues. Now, remember I said it was unrealistic, but I'm still, I I'm still want to be positive and, and optimistic. I'm not just talking about Iran's nuclear program. I'm talking also about this intractable relationship it has with Israel and its support for Assad and Hezbollah. Iran, let's, in this dream that I'm spinning out, Iran agrees to stop uranium enrichment beyond the 20% level. It agrees to ship that enriched uranium that's above 20% to a third neutral country like Brazil or Turkey. Um, the US and allies agree to end sanctions and offer full recognition and trade relations to Iran. But let's not stop there. Iran persuades Assad to step down and he's replaced by a caretaker government appointed with <clears throat> the agreement of Turkey and Iran. Elections would be held in a specified time frame for a democratically elected government. Power would be shared among the various ethnic groups. Iran also would agree to stop arming Hezbollah in return for US pressure on Israel to settle all outstanding issues between Lebanon and Syria. The Golan would be returned to Syria Lebanese territory returned and its prisoners that are in Israel, the few that are left, are, would be freed. Israel and Syria would recognize each other for the first time since 1948. Now, let's turn to the really thorny part, the Palestinians. And this is where it may be even more unrealistic than everything up until now, but humor me. The US would have to force Israel to agree to a settlement that would involve withdrawal to 1967 borders, recognition of a Palestinian state, sharing Jerusalem as its capital, and return of refugees. What would Israel get? It would get the US and United Nations as guarantors of the peace. The Saudi peace initiative would be sealed, and Arab states would end their hostilities with Israel and recognize it, and exchange ambassadors, and trade, and all the other things that would come along with that. It does sound crazy, I admit. But remember, there was a day in Reykjavik a few decades ago when Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan sat together and they almost agreed to nuclear disarmament. They came this close. It didn't happen, but at least they talked seriously about it. Within a few years after that, even though it didn't work that time, <laughs> the Soviet Union collapsed and it brought an end of the Cold War and an end of the era of mutually assured destruction. It fundamentally realigned the world. And while it didn't end conflicts, it did substantially reduce the danger of nuclear war. What my dream requires is two leaders, and perhaps other leaders as well, who rise to the occasion, like Gorbachev and Reagan almost did. Leaders who foresee a grand plan to resolve some of the worst, most intractable conflicts in the region for the sake of all the peoples of the region. Think of Abraham Lincoln after the Civil War as he contemplated reintegrating the Confederate States in the Union. Think of Eleanor Roosevelt as she gave the opening speech of the United Nations in 1946 in San Francisco. Think of Nelson Mandela as he left Robben Island after decades in prison and prepared to dismantle apartheid with his partner, who had been his former enemy, F.W. de Klerk. Stranger things have happened. Do Rouhani and Obama have it in them? Probably not. I'm not foolish enough to believe that they really do. They may be such creatures of their respective systems that they can't break out of them and seize such an opportunity. But wouldn't it be grand to think what they could do if they appealed to those better angels of their nature? Instead of nattering, our respective countries, instead of the nattering our respective countries have engaged in against each other since 1979. I have such a dream, and I hope that they do too. 
And thank you very much. No, I didn't no. hear it. Okay. Actually, it was oh, the whole... uh, she she asked about um, the involvement of the United Nations in the in dealing with refugees or in the conflict. Well, I think the United Nations is, should be an organization that shouldn't exist any longer. Actually, it really isn't doing half the things that it should be doing. Um, the UN is, you know, we've gotten a number of organizations that have donated funds, uh, but the UN doesn't go after them to fulfill the obligation that they gave. So that's why everyone is running out of, of money at this point. Um, I, you know, you see the UN organizations that are there, they come in, they visit, they see, they give funds, but it's not anywhere near enough of what is being done at all. Uh, my sense is that the United Nations could serve a useful role once there was a consensus that was worked out among the, the, the great powers that I described that were involved. And it could serve as the imprimatur, the Security Council could, of reinforcing. It could possibly send in uh, peacekeeping troops to guarantee some of the borders um, uh, and separate some of the, the, the warring parties. Um, but I don't think the UN can play a role where it would negotiate a peace or, or, or create something unless there was already that will. And, and you mentioned uh, uh, Brahimi who, who tried to uh, negotiate with Assad unsuccessfully. Um, and, and when, um, and, and I think also uh, Kofi Annan tried as well. So there have been several people who, on behalf of the United Nations who have been the liaison and, and really hasn't worked because Assad isn't prepared to engage in any kind of meaningful dialogue. I mean, he's willing to talk as long as it means that he keeps power, but he's not willing to talk in terms of getting ready to step down or negotiating an end to his rule. That isn't, you know, anywhere near happening. Yes, in the back, too. I'd like to make a statement as opposed to a question, although you might feel free to comment on it. Uh, you've left out one major, major, major player that no one seems to talk about. And I'll classify all three as one. It's called religion. And we can start everywhere around the world, get the people from all three religions, and say, you know, religion has been used for centuries. To divide and the, for the, to divide people and destruct destruction, you can use religion, the same religion as a tool to unite the people. Now, as soon as you get the three the three religions taking their role their role in the world and uniting the people, that will resolve everything. And you can move it move it this instead of worrying about how to fight the lawmakers, they have ge their geopolitics to get the religions to help unite and move towards a different world. Um, clearly, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously some truth in what you're saying. Um, the question is how does religion come into this conflict? And, and when I talk about the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, uh, there's clearly religion at, at work in, the, in that as well between Jews and, and, and Muslims, and there are some Christians in Israel as well. Um, my sense, though, is that the conflict in Israel is a political conflict. It's a, it's, it's a power. It's a conflict of, of power. Oh, wait, wait, let me talk. Let me talk. Um, of course, religion co comes into play, and you, but usually religion comes into play in terms of the extremists on both sides who either are religious themselves and see the conflict as a religious conflict or want to articulate the conflict as a religious conflict because then it couldn't be resolved. And it's in the interests of the most extreme on either side of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for it to continue and, and not be resolved. So they would rather formulate, they would rather, for example, have you know, Jews and Muslims fighting each other on the Temple Mount and have Jews try to destroy the Temple Mount and then we have you know, holy war and, 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 and a whole entire mess like that. I'm not as much of an expert about Syria Clearly, there is a, a religious conflict there as well between Sunni and Shia, and there are Christians involved as well. Um, but I think in that situation as well, until the conflict started, Assad was not, he, he was an Alawite, but religion was not an important issue in the conflict. It was really, again, it was a family 
uh, a corrupt, brutal family dynasty. So it was a, 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 it was a war over power and who was going to control the, the goodies and the, and the resources. Um, it has become a religious conflict, and that's what I said in my talk. The longer it goes on, the more these, these, um, these sort of eternal hatreds, religious conflict and hatreds between Sunni and Shia can be brought into the conflict, and they in turn will make it almost impossible to solve. Um, so it's, it's very complicated, obviously. Yeah, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, Syria has all religions in Syria, and it always has. Syria has also been one of the only countries in the Middle East where we had civil marriages. No place else had civil marriages. So that means as a Christian, if you were marrying a Muslim, you did not have to convert or vice versa. Um, you could walk around the streets and you would hear all the different languages. We had Armenians, you had Orthodox, you had the Druze, you had Alawites, you had Shias, you had Sunnis. I mean, we had everything there. It is now breaking up, and you're finding now that there's a lot of inner fighting with all the religions. You have all the different um, military groups that are there, and we have a lot of mercenaries. I mean, that's one thing, is you have mercenaries that are there from Libya, uh, from Iraq, from Iran, uh, from Lebanon, from all over. Uh, yesterday, I actually had one of the people in my office that was with the NTC in Libya. And, you know, I says, what the hell? Can't you get your Libyans back? I mean, why do we have so many Libyan mercenaries here that are doing this killing and doing everything? He says, we don't want them back. These are vicious. You know, you guys can keep them or they can go somewhere else because we have our own fighting in Libya. And these are people that are just going from one conflict to another and carrying it on. So, I mean, it's really religion wasn't there. I mean, it's, it's become, it's like the Iraq crisis. We didn't have, it wasn't religious. We just never had that. You know, now it's all talked about uh, Shia, Sunnis and Shiites and stuff. But when you live in the Middle East, you never knew who was who or who, you know, who your neighbor was. It didn't matter at all. Now it does. Right. Exactly. And that's why it's up to you. You know, if you're talking to the people, the people do not want boots on the ground. They do not want anyone uh, coming in. They want to resolve it on their own. The only thing that they were asking for is to have no fly zones right at the borders, at the Turkish-Syrian border, the Iraqi-Syrian border, the Jordan-Syrian border, where all the civilians are, and that's where their camps are at. The people that are asking for intervention right now is some of the rebel groups that are asking for it, and they want training and they want arms to come in. But um, I don't think it's, you know, we need to have that. We shouldn't have it, because each side, and I'll just go with Richard said, each side is doing atrocities against the people. The people at the very beginning supported the rebels, or what we called the rebels. Uh, but as time went on, they now don't support the rebels because they're seeing that the rebel groups are individual little fractions on their own. And they're like little mafiosas all over the place. And they're doing what they want to do and not listening to what the people want. They ended up bringing the fighting into the cities, into the schools, into uh, the World Heritage sites and destroying the country. And instead of doing it outside or fighting in the desert so that uh, Bashar's people came in and they bombed inside the cities, which didn't need to be, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Richard. Let me, for the sake of discussion, let me press. Uh, I love your dream. I have a very similar kind of dream. All right? Uh, so let's make that a plus. If you look at the United States' strategic global position, we clearly have messed up terribly. The American public is not in support of intervention. Uh, so therefore, the United States probably will not interact. Uh, I also added the conversation Russia. Its only Mediterranean port is in Syria. And Russia is not going to give that up, I do not think. Uh, we haven't talked about the Saudi link, but there's another link there we might want to address. The point I want to make is that if you take your position and we wait for the dream and uh, no one intervenes, I would suggest 
that the Assad forces are currently winning, not losing, and that, that is, as long as they control the airspace, they are going to win. Uh, and I want to bring it to the human tragedy. We are going, if we stand around and just wait, and I don't know who, what the answer is, right? So I understand the complexity of the problem. But what about the human dimension of this? What about what Reed is talking about? What do we do? I mean, we're talking about tens of that, what Reed is, but we're talking hundreds of thousands of people who are under severe stress and difficulty. What do we do? Uh, that's what I started my talk by saying that it was uh, a moral dilemma. Um, you know, the first, uh, the first command of a doctor is do no harm. And um, so we could go in with the best of intentions. I mean, look, everyone here heard Don Rumsfeld and, and um, George Bush and talked and heard the, the kind of like optimism in their voice, their crazy kind of deluded optimism. But, you know, from their point of view, it was all going to be, you know, nice, easy fight. We were going to topple Saddam. We were going to bring in democracy. We were going to turn the Middle East into a flowering, you know, democratic you know, region. Look at what we did. Um, so if we don't do anything, I, I, I admit it allows the butcher to succeed. But my sense is, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't know what is going to happen. Assad is not going to, in the long run, continue to be the ruler. He's not going to win. He can't win. Um, the, only way, the only way he could win is if Iran and Hezbollah so escalate the conflict that um, they cross a bunch of red lines, and then the U.S. will intervene, or Turkey will. You know, it, it, it's not... <sighs> I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm at a loss really to, to describe this because I don't know what is going to happen. But my general sense is that Assad will not win. I don't know how that will play itself out. I don't know whether, if and when he falls, whether Syria is going to turn into a bunch of little statelets with, you know, uh, these mafiosi that you were talking about running, you know, sort of like what is in Iraq right now. You have these sort of uh, strongmen uh, or Afghanistan running little regions of the country, and the country is not a coherent whole. Um, so I don't know what, I, don't, I can't foresee what's going to happen in Syria, but um, I don't foresee, just because the momentum right now is on Assad's side, I don't foresee that uh, being true in the, in the long run. Um, this is going to be a long conflict that's going to work itself out over, possibly over years, um, and uh, my, preference is to see that uh, justice and, 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 and the morally right course ends up winning. It obviously doesn't always, but um, I'd like to keep that sort of close to my heart as to what will happen here. I don't know how, though. Yes, Joanne. Um, I think I have a question of kind of more immediate concern. Uh, I know that you have incredibly got a number of containers already to Jordan. Do you have do you have any energy to continue the containers? And if so, what should the next containers contain? And if there are people here who can contribute, what kinds of things are you needing? She wants to know what kinds of the uh, the next ba the next container we're still looking for rehab equipment. Um, so anyone that has any old uh, bicycles or gym equipment or anything like that is going to be taken. We're going to be collecting again um, for the fall also. So if anyone has any great clothing and more blankets, it's going to be coming in. So we're collecting a lot of that. Uh, so anything that people can think of. Uh, we're looking for school supplies, old DVDs um, of tapes so the people in the hospitals, they can watch these. Um, if anyone has anything that shows, because uh, right now you're here, you know, in the US and Europe, there's a lot of people that have, have amputated limbs and they're climbing Mount Everest, they're climbing, they're doing things. People there don't think that they can do that. They think they don't have a life anymore. So we have that. A lot of school supplies that we want to deal with with the kids because what they do is they're just laying in the hospital beds. 
for just laying there and not doing anything. And there's TVs and they watch the war and they just get more and more depressed. And so we're trying to deal with that. Um, so anything that someone can think of um, has to be all in really good condition uh, to be able to get it into the country at all. But thank you. Other questions? I, I, I have one I'd like to have you comment on the potential for, uh, for some positive results from Geneva II. And uh, Geneva II is, is a proposal, an agreement uh, to convene a, a conference in Geneva between the, the participants in this conflict. Uh, to my understanding, <coughs> the United States has not given an indication as to whether they would agree to allow Iran to participate. Could you comment? Um, yes, I've heard about this, and um, you know, I'm torn about it. Uh, on the one hand, it, you know, it's it's a it's a serious attempt to help in some way, unspecified way. But on the other hand, it may be just two superpowers, the United States and Russia, wanting to say they, they did something. They tried to do something. They may fail, but at least they tried. Um, to, to my mind, unless Assad sees his regime is at stake and that his life and, and the life of his family is at stake, um, there isn't going to, all of these things are not going to really work. That's why Brahimi failed and Kofi Annan failed and why, um, you know, I don't see how Russia is going to bring Assad to heel to, to Vienna and, um, and, and, and make him all of a sudden willing to negotiate in some serious way with the opposition. And the other, you know, on the other hand, I don't see the opposition as being united enough, coherent enough to, um, put forward a, 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 what's the right word, um, a, a, a credible op, uh, alternative. I mean, that's what you need. You need a credible alternative to Assad. You need a leader representing the opposition. Right now, there's a bunch of factions. Nobody, they point one leader, and within a week, he's resigned because who knows what happened, you know, what thing blew up internally. So that is not promising. Um, and, and I'm sorry to be so downbeat, but you know, I, I, that's the way I see it. Well, you know, we've had all these conferences, Friends of Syria, and the problem is, I think it's like Richard said, you can't, if Bashar is not willing to talk to anyone, and the opposition won't talk to him, you know, there's no reason to have any more meetings. And the opposition is broken up into more and more fractions every week it keeps breaking up into more fractions and they're not you know, like the other countries like libya and whatever they had a government already set up they've been working on it for years 30 years to overthrow Gaddafi, and we're working on it and so they were somewhat organized when it um, when the arab spring came in syria it wasn't that case i mean you just didn't have the people that are there that are willing to take over or that anyone trusts or that anyone knows at all. At the, I mean, right now when you talk to some of the actual Syrians on the ground and the ones that have left, they say, we want Bashar back. We don't care what's happened. We can't continue with the way life is for us right now. We'll live under what he was gaining because they're not seeing the rebels are standing up to what they promised the people. And so we on the outside, you know, we can see this going on and on and on, but we can't see if no one's willing to talk to each other, you know, there's not gonna be any type of remedy. And when you have the US coming in and supplying a group, which they don't even trust with weapons and training, you know, they're just intensifying more of the fighting and making it worse. I mean, we talk about the chemical weapons. Well, I've actually seen people that where the chemical weapons have been used on them. But we don't really know if it was just the government that had those weapons or actually the rebels that had them and used them. I mean, that's the thing that you have to think about. Both sides 
have broken human right violations regularly on a daily basis. And this is one of the only wars that is being fought by social media, that we are there with the people on a daily basis. You've never seen it before. So people are taking videos, they're downloading them, and you're seeing them immediately. So you can see the atrocity of both sides. You don't know who's dubbed what or changed what or added what. I know at the very beginning, I would seen they were throwing bodies into the river in Hama where you had the water wheels and it was raging waters and things. And I go, we've never had raging waters in those places. It was always very little bit of water that you had. So someone's doctored a lot of this stuff. So you just don't know what's actually happening. And as long as you don't know, and social media is out there, and they're fighting, and you've got mercenaries coming in, I, you know, it's sad to say, but I can't see a resolve in, you know, in the really near future at all. I just see it continuing. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Rita, can you tell us a little more about the organization that uh, you're directing and what partners you have, or it's, you know, uh, well, it reminds me very, very much of growing up in China in the 30s. Uh, and in that particular thing, the things that happened that were good were really people-to-people -people, uh, efforts, uh, small efforts, uh, a lot of different organizations that were really not collected, but I, you know, um, you're a wonderful woman, but I, you can't do this obviously all by yourself. And I don't understand uh, the pieces. And it sounds to me as though, is it just Seattle? It, are you in LA or are you uh, in Well, uh, what's, yeah. Uh, what's the nature of the. Okay. WFA? Salam actually started. Uh, Atlanta? Uh, no, Salam started here in Seattle. Okay. And it was an organization that I started because I started seeing that the artifacts and the history of the Middle East were disappearing. And so I was doing most of that as educational and to do collections of art and historical values and things. And then when um, the Iraq War started, we started changing, you know, and developing different things. We do a lot of educational work. We do it mostly in Seattle, but we've also done things in other cities. So I've gone to California. We've done fundraisers in California and other places. I actually are partnering with Mercy Corps, which is out of Portland. But Mercy Corps does not do medical work. Uh, so they're working with us in the teaching programs. Uh, we also are working with NAMA, which is the National Arab American Medical Association. And those are, we have a chapter here in Seattle. Those are Arab American doctors that are here in the US that are licensed. And so those are the people that I hit out to, and those are the doctors that come in with us on our mission. The other organization is SAMS, which is the Syrian American Medical Association, and that's also out of the East Coast. And they do most of their work inside of Syria and on the borders. So I help them in, in getting them medical supplies. So we're partnering with a lot of different organizations, definitely. And you know we have to do whatever. And my whole focus has been medical. But then I also, once we get that going and we have these missions going on a regular basis, now we're working on doing educational work for the, the students. Uh, one of the groups here is Disaster International that's working with me, and that's going in. They went into Oklahoma at the, right after tornadoes, and they work with the families. And um, I left two people in Jordan right now that are working now with setting up a, a trauma center to work with, um, with the children and families. So you're training, the concentration here is on the camps. Right. So, uh, it's, well, it's not the camp camps. It's the people outside of the camps. It reminds me somewhat. It just has to start someplace. It has to start, That's yes. it. You know? it. The question is, can you, know, can you plant the seed in other places? Um, well, I think so. We, there's a lot. The Syrian 
the Syrians are a little bit different than other Arabs in that they've never had to deal with anything like this in their lives. And what's really interesting is they're getting a lot of their support from the Palestinians that are in Jordan because they've gone through those experiences. So when anyone comes into a clinic, they usually have someone with them that's a Palestinian Jordanian that is sort of walking through it. Like, I've gone through this, I know what it feels like, it's a little bit worse for you, but I'll help you out. And it's been really great in that sense that they're doing it, uh, more than uh, Jordanian Jordanians. Because they haven't gone through it. I mean, you know, there's no group that's going through what the Syrians are going through right now. I mean, the amount of the atrocities that are taking place, no matter what you see in Egypt, Tunisia, maybe Algeria back in the 70s, you, you, you had the thing. But you always knew who your enemy was. In Syria, you really, you know, you didn't know that the government could be so vicious, so atrocious, the atrocities that are taking place. How large is the Syrian, the American Syrian population? They're one of the, uh, the Syrian Lebanese population are the largest population in the U.S. Uh, here, they came in, in Seattle area, the Syrian Lebanese, came back in 1908, were the first ones that came through here. So you'll have a, the huge populations are in Ohio and in Dearborn, and we'll have them in um, the Newark area in New York. There's, there's a huge population. Uh, biggest population that we have are mostly are in, in medicine. I mean, you can look back up and you find that this first surgeon that came up, uh, the heart transplant was a Syrian American. You know, so we have a lot of Syrians, but they're all broken up which side they belong to. So we have to watch who I ask, you know, if you, you know, if you want to come to Syria with me or not. No, I'm but a Bashar's uh, person. Totally neutral in terms of that particular thing. Yeah. So, you know, uh, in that regard, and you have to maintain, as you say, your right. total neutrality in terms of getting these groups to work with just the needs of people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for me to get my NGO status in Jordan, I had a three-hour interview with the Mukhabarat, which is the secret police. And they came out and, you know, it's very similar to our FBI here. Same thing, they come up with this big file on me and they go, okay. And I think they're just trying to prove that they knew a lot about me, which I know. They said, well, you in the 70s you were at the PLO. Yes, okay. And that's why we took away your passport. Okay, you know, your ex-husband was so-and-so Syrian. Are you still doing, you know, so they go back into your whole history and then they wanna make sure that I understand that I have to watch everything I do. I have to be very careful of who I get my money from, everything. And it's the same thing here in the US because the US still has a possibility. They're saying, you know, we need to know where your money is going that you're not supplying to the wrong party, that you're not buying arms at all with it. If you're going into Syria, where are you going in? Who are you going in with? Who's allowing you in? I mean, each time I go, I come back. Within a week, I have FBI at my office wanting to ask questions. So I am as clean as a whistle, and I have everything is documented. I have receipts for everything that I buy. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's, wonderful. It's, a, it's, it's a miracle. We've talked about a miracle or a dream. You have the dream next to you. Uh, and, uh, uh, it, but, you know, it's, it's, I, it's, it's so much people of people that yeah. you just have to go out and plant other seeds and, and get things going. And Rita, be, before uh, people depart, could you? Uh, talk about the things that you brought there. Oh, the table. yeah, there are some things in the back room that are being made by the Syrian refugee women. And this is how they're sort of supporting themselves. So I bring it back if anyone wants to buy anything or they can write a check out to SCM on it. And the money goes back directly to the women on everything that um, is bought. So we just want to make them feel like they have to start a new life and uh, 
you know, by doing this stuff, they can restart, that life is not dead. You know, they, they'll have to start supporting themselves because most of their husbands have died at some point or other. So, um, so if anyone wants, it'd be great. And I'd like to know, if, you know, that all the doctors that go back with me are not Arab Americans. I did have a doctor that was from Portland, Oregon, that was on this trip. He's never been to the Middle East in his life. I had another doctor that's here from Seattle that has gone on this trip. Never been um, in the Middle East at all. And the Syrians are just become so emotional to know that people care. Other people that are not in the Middle East really care enough to give up their you know, practice for 10 days, pay um, you know, to come on these trips and work, and they work 12-hour days, 14-hour days that they're working at, going from one village to another. So and I mean, it's, keep them uh, I mean, well and rested. You know, so, no, Seattle's great, and I thank everyone. May I, may I say thanks to our speakers, Rita Zaweda, Richard Silverstein. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming out on a very hot evening, and uh, we, we appreciate it.